All right. How you doing? I'm good. I'm it's good. uh, it's great to have you on the podcast. Yeah. Nice or time. television show or whatever this is these days. I know it is technically you got your YouTube, you got your listening. So it's like a, it's a TV, audio, all the things. Yeah. And uh, did you have a good Super Bowl Sunday? I mean, it was, I was by myself. I was, I was live, I was on Zoom with Jason okay. and we were just, we were actually on for a record eight hours. Eight hours. Yeah. On Zoom. Because we, you know, the long distance relationship. And so we, uh, you know, like usually like the most it's been is six. Mm-hmm. So yesterday was a. The record. The record. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. But. Yeah, how are you? I mean, I I Good. heard some Trying. things about uh, what you guys were talking about and did, and how you guys connected. But yeah, I'm I'm just I'm just popping in this little relationship now. So well, I'm it's it. yeah. I mean, it's it's been wild. So I've lived abroad for like 25 years. Mm-hmm. I left um, North America when I was like 22. Okay. And uh, 24 years, and yeah, so I, I moved to China. Right. Um, and I worked for the New York Times in China and then started making adventure television shows for like BBC and Discovery. Yeah. And that was uh, great fun. And then um, during COVID, I kind of got stuck in Istanbul. Oh, which is where know. I picked up a couple cats. Yeah. yeah. I can't believe you brought them. <laughs> <laughs> They've been everywhere. They've been to more than like 20 countries. Yeah. So. Oh my gosh. My cats are at. I took her to Virginia like for the holidays and she was upside down. Her cat like, meow, meow, like the. Just, I don't know how. Just freaking out. Mm. But I didn't. I didn't drug her this time, and she was still a little. It's all good. Anyways, <laughs> but Jason and I met uh, online because he was thinking about doing some climbing, um, and right. seen some of my shows or, or come across me on social media, and then we were chatting because he really wanted to climb Mount Kilimanjaro um, in 2020, and then yeah. So I think we were chatting about that, and then COVID hit. And then I was doing like a version of a podcast while I was stuck in lockdown. Called Co- like, Co- yeah, yeah, which was on Instagram. Okay. Um, and that's where we connected. And then since now I've come back to the United States, um, I'm trying to just reconnect with like the people I did those COVID calls yeah. with and just check in and see how they are like four years later. Yeah, because he, he did do Kilimanjaro and good for him. <laughs> You're not into the mountains, I reckon? I'm, um, I am fitness, wellness gymnastic endurance is not my um thing Thing, yeah he's the he's he is the quintessential yeah. uh, endurance man yeah 100 milers climbing just I, i'm like i'm a good sprinter like i will go 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 and then i'm gassed but okay. endurance is, is t- mm-hmm. but he should do like an adventure with you for sure i yeah i would love to get him out um I want to try to, I, there's a few adventures in the United States I'd really like to try to lock down in the next couple of months. So maybe I can drag him out for um, for one of these. Yeah, that'd be good. Just mm-hmm. just work him. Just, yeah. So he'll work me one you or know, the other. Like he was talking about, give him some purpose, give him something to train for, you know? That's yeah. true, yeah. yeah. That, that'd be epic. So so where are you from originally? Manhattan Beach, California, right here. Oh. Right here. <laughs> right here. And yeah. have you lived in California your whole life? Yeah, I went to USC. Um, yeah, so I've I've traveled a lot. I love travel, but actually living somewhere, it's always been LA. And and why is it that you just always come back to LA or you just can't leave? It's just the, is it the sunshine? Um, well yeah, that's a big one for me. I can't I can't do like darkness and rain and cold. No, I like warmth, but it's it's more so I'm an only child. Um I was raised by a single mom and a lot of my family is like here. I was looking to buy in Vegas. I've been looking to buy in like Nashville and Raleigh and all all over, but I never just, I never did it. Um, Austin's the big one right now, right? Everyone's moving to Texas. Like it's just LA and Texas now. Like everybody I know lives in Austin, so I don't need to, I don't need to just pick up and move the same thing. I was trying to get a change, but um yeah, I just I don't know. I I like it. Mm. I'm I've liked it here. I'm starting to not like it, but with what I do, fitness modeling, training, I have my whole client roster here. It's like if I did move, I'm starting over from zero. So That's tough. Yeah. That would be really hard like you'd have to build up your whole clientele, your whole network right. again. Right. Mm. That's I'm like I'm thinking about it. I feel like I'm going to need to do that, especially with 
this relationship and, you know, being cross country. Um, so I'm trying to find this way to kind of bridge it and focus on my, um, the thing that doesn't have to be in person. Right. So my app, the things that I do virtually, and then start to kind of grow the audience around the country. So it's less of like a drastic change. Well, this, this business is something that I've never really understood mm -hmm. and it's great that you're here so we can get right into it. Yeah. So like this whole, like, you know, this whole like celebrity fitness thing and keeping yourself fit and everything, it's just so LA and it's so what everyone seems to be doing in this town, you know, just trying to avoid getting fat, avoid, you know, getting unhealthy, uh, especially yeah. coming back after COVID now, actor strike is over. Yeah. I thought it would be like more of a thing, especially after COVID. It wasn't. I think because people were so bored during COVID and everyone bought equipment, they bought at home stuff. Then they just got like tired of doing everything at home and on their own. And so I thought they would want to go back into training or have a trainer. And that didn't really happen the way I thought it would, like how the fitness bubble like blew up during COVID and then it just burst and it hasn't started reinflating. What were you doing during COVID, just out of curiosity? Did you have, like, clients that were you doing online sessions and things like that? Yeah, we shifted to online. Um, I st in my company, Train Like a Gymnast, we started doing this thing called Digital Summits. So I would find different instructors around the country. They would send me, like, a 15 to 30-minute session of them teaching something. And then we'd get people to come on, and I used kind of a similar system to this where I was – doing it live and I was um, putting in like their session, commercial breaks, their another trainer session and people would sign up for like these six hour thing. I was just throwing shit at the wall to see what would stick during that time. Um, I did one or two retreats during COVID, but it it was really hard to convince people to travel during COVID, yeah. of course. Um, but yeah, I I was just trying to survive and thankfully I did survive where a lot of businesses didn't. Um, but it still feels like I'm, I'm like starting over because everything's different now. Everything, everything is really different. Yeah, that's the truth. Everything. I mean, I'm in LA, like, and and not traveling the world 300 days a year climbing mountains. So yeah, things are things have changed a lot. But it's yeah. it's funny. Like I was chatting with someone the other day, and they said like they run an outdoor adventure company in Utah, and they said like um, after the initial lockdown, it was like COVID cocaine was yeah. was the term mentioned just because everyone wanted to do outdoor activities, everyone yeah. wanted to be outside, so. They were taking people hiking, yeah, uh, and uh, dirt biking and everything in southern Utah, and they said it was like huge. And then now, now that it's 2023, 2024 again, people are, you know, they have more options. They can right. get on an airplane again. So, so now the numbers have come back down. Right. But they had a huge bump in like 2020, yep. 2021, 2022. Yeah, yeah, we did. I mean, we did some outdoor on the San Monica Pier too. But it was just weird. Like even even filming. And getting our own media and stuff, like with people being six feet apart, everyone has a mask on. And then also when you put that back up on your website, it's not evergreen. You're, you know exactly when that was shot. And you're like, okay, well, I guess I need some new stuff now. And it's it's just, it was so weird. It was a weird time. Some non-mask content. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I need to bulk that better. It's four years. I can't believe it's been four years. For, for 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 crazy years, I have a lot of friends in film and television, and also in um, adventure, and and who are all entrepreneurs who yep. have their own companies, who make their own kind of stories, content, all this stuff, and they we all got crushed during COVID. It was it was crazy. Like somehow, like the boring nine to five job that you can somehow do from home was like the savior through COVID. But all of us were freelancing yeah. and out on the edge all the time. Yeah, yeah. And, and then the um the unemployment. Like if you had to apply for unemployment, but you were an independent contractor, like the system wasn't even prepped for you yeah. because you're like, I don't have a W-2. Like, what am I supposed to base my income? It was wild, wild time. And then like one of my clients, he was a, a VP at Merrill Lynch and he always used to poo poo the, um, the, the millennials and having their, <laughs> their like, their virtual stuff, their work from home. And now he's like all for it. It's like, oh yeah, we weren't that stupid, were we? We 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 had something going, and now he loves that he doesn't have to drive as far. He doesn't have to like everything. Everything's changed. Everything upside down. Point point being, right. everything's different. <laughs>
So, so what was it like growing up in um, Manhattan Beach, like on the water? You know, what what was it like, kind of growing up in uh, in Los in the I'm one of the, in the people. nice parts of Los Angeles. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I'm so grateful to be from there. I actually grew up in the same house that my mom did. Are you serious? And went That's to the crazy. Same, the elementary school that she did, and um, had some of the same teachers. One of, like was a substitute at, at my time, but. I was never like fully into water. I'm not a great swimmer. It's just we've tried. So, and it's, uh, it's not a thing. Not 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 something that you need to revisit. Uh, if if I'm in the water and I'm like, and it's life or death, it's just like a take me. I understand. Um, so <laughs> in Manhattan Beach, it was great. However, I was one of the only few part black people in my. I didn't have a black friend until high school. And the diversity expanded once I went to USC as well. So I had this kind of like identity stuff from growing up in Manhattan Beach. I just felt like I'm me. I'm just, I'm Danielle. I do gymnastics. And I never really realized that people saw me differently until I was older. Just, uh, that's an interesting whole other topic that we could get into but uh, so manhattan beach is a predominantly caucasian community or at least it was when you were growing up because i i don't I, i'm not from here so you're gonna have to walk me through the the complexity because i'm i grew up in toronto canada right and when i grew up in toronto canada um so canada is obviously this wonderful multicultural country and toronto is this incredible multicultural city right. but it wasn't when i was growing up it's something that's kind of happened in the yeah. last 30 years so i didn't i didn't have a black friend until I was in high school yeah because yeah that my entire mid my entire middle school was Caucasian pretty much maybe a few a few Asian kids same yeah, yeah. it's pretty much that and it's so funny because Jason's upbringing was completely opposite it so was. we're so similar but like completely different uh his time at Southern Kentucky was uh it wasn't too mu- wasn't too multicultural I know and then with his I mean as he said like his high school his first dates and stuff and where he grew up very different so Yes, Manhattan Beach, it's probably changed a little bit now, but it was pretty much like 89, 90% Caucasian, maybe like 3% Asian, maybe 2% Latino, Black, like one, I don't know, 1% Black, and then like other, the rest of it. So, yeah. So what is Manhattan Beach? Like explain this to people who aren't familiar with California. There's a lot of people watching in Asia where 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 we where I did a lot of TV for a long time. So so people think like, oh Manhattan, that's on the East Coast in in New York. But then there's a Manhattan Beach that's in LA and it's like a suburb and it's kinda nice. So walk me through that. Okay. So if you Google Manhattan Beach. Okay. <laughs> It'll explain everything and we can and we can move on. Yeah, no, it's just like it's a beautiful beach city. Think of like Beach Boys. Um, cause Hermosa beach is the neighboring town and there's a lot of good surfing there. I'm definitely, you know, I'm not a water sport person, but it's known for water sports. It's known for, um, the AVP, like the, the volleyball tournament, six man. And, um, there's just, there's so much that goes on there. When I grew well, my grandparents bought the house there in 1961 for $17,000. I love those stories. Don't you? <laughs> yeah. So fun. Um, good time now it's worth 17 million <laughs> yeah no i wish they actually did live on the strand but they didn't own that if they could have bought that that would have been incredible but we're inland a little bit so it's like two point something and then all of the siblings obviously will sell whatever but it's um we remodeled the house that my mom and i grew up in in 2003 and it's just like it was always entertainment money like I had some friends whose parents were producers on shows or animators or writers and that kind of thing it was always entertainment and sports and now I feel like it's changed to a lot more like new money where the the people who have gotten rich fast are there because like who who can buy a house 17 million dollars cash like what what am I doing wrong I just spent four years in Dubai. I know quite a few people that could probably do that. Yeah, <laughs> but I don't know where the money came from, and you yeah. shouldn't ask a lot of questions. Yeah, that's that's kind of where it's it's going to. Like some of some of the Strand homes are like thirty two million, and I just I I, I was like maybe I should just get into real estate because I know the South Bay really well, and I could tell you which streets of this and that, and then I just sell like one home a year, you know. But it's not. 
I love it, but it's just I'm one thing: fitness. I do all the things. I need to focus. Focusing is hard in LA because you see so many people doing yeah. so many interesting things, and like I have people coming yeah. here, and they're writers, they're producers, mm -hmm. they're you know they're into fitness, they're into sports or or whatever. And you, yeah. you're right, like you can kind of get caught up and twisted around in circles yeah. if you don't really stay focused. It's hard because you, you ha like you have to. You there's you have to have more than one thing. You can't just do one thing here. It's not possible if you want to live and survive. But, but when you grew up, it was possible to do one thing. Like parents did do one thing and they still managed to own cars and own homes and mm -hmm. things like that. Don't and... even get me started. Mm -hmm. it's no. So, so I am, I am like, I'm reading um, Vivian Tu's new book, The Rich AF. She's like a financial TikToker. And about just like how the rich stay rich, the w the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. We don't have the middle class anymore. And there's and even in entertainment, it's not just like finances, just the amount of gatekeepers that just keep information. And it's happened to me. I'm someone who I love to help people and see people thrive. And when someone asks me something, I give them the answer. But then I see they take that and they run off and then they're more successful with it. And that happens a lot. It's like, OK, learn from the mistakes, but somehow I don't. And then when I ask maybe that same person or someone else a question, they're like, mm, that's not my information to share. You should ask this person or you should just research this. And I'm like, okay. I think all the answers are on YouTube, right? I mean, eventually like. I think, but there's some stuff that just, it's it's a lot about people you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jason and I were talking about this yesterday with the Super Bowl, like just the people who are in boxes and things. It, a lot of it's who you know and well that's the i mean but when you talk about like like the las vegas or the miami f1 or the super bowl i mean we're talking about like the global elite are coming from all over the world yeah. to these singular events these aren't even just the people who are wealthy in the united states yeah, I and mean, they're okay. they're coming in from the globe and and mm -hmm. you know for someone like me who lived 18 years in shanghai china mm -hmm. I mean, you could fill up, you know, th all the boxes in the Super Bowl yes. with millionaires and billionaires just from China. I believe that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was just, as I was driving in here, too, all these, like, you know, black hired cars with drivers just, like, waiting outside. So maybe people are coming back into town from yesterday, and it's uh, it's nuts. And I was in Monaco November of last year for the first time, because I've been to Nice and, you know, stuff like that, but I went with my friend uh, and just being in Monaco. It was just a different culture. I am not a big, I've never had alcohol. I don't drink caffeine. I I do fish, but I'm not like a yacht boater. Like I don't- And what are you doing in Monaco? <laughs> exactly. I was like, okay, cool, we're here, but there's literally like nothing. I'm not, I don't like designer stuff. I don't wear jewelry much. I put on jewelry intentionally because I knew this was on camera, but like I, I we were just like, okay, want to go like hike? tomorrow I'm like there's, there's such a different lifestyle with so many of these things and then I was like okay if I were there like what do I do I don't gamble so what, what would I be doing yeah it's just a it's just a money hub really tax-free same with Dubai too uh, yeah and Qatar like these are just kind of tax-free zones where people accumulate capital buy property yeah put their mistresses in it that's a big deal yeah and Monaco is all Russian money I noticed yeah a that's a lot and the F1 guys are all there yes yeah there's, there's the Russian, there's the Italian. Yeah, because I didn't see, I didn't see a lot of like Middle Eastern. I didn't see a lot of Asian or anything. That's a, it's very, it's a very European hub there. Yeah. So. Slightly overrated, except during the F1. The Monaco F1 yeah. is quite special. Yeah. Yeah, we we drove through what that course would be, and I was like, oh my gosh. But yeah, I mean, cool. We saw some big boats and some pretty gardens and changing of the guard. And it was good. Yeah, it was cool. All fun. The end. <laughs> the end. It was, it, was small. it was pretty and like really clean and that would be nice to have a clean place where you live and have police and security that we can down another topic of LAPD, but we're not. That's 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 a step too far. So so Manhattan Beach, early days, I mean I mean, it must have been safe. You, what were, I mean, what were you doing um, school-wise at that stage? Were you? When did you kind of get into your sporting career? How young were you? I mean, I started gymnastics when I was four. So I think I started gymnastics when I was that's, four. That's Soccer and gymnastics. Yeah. I did them together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same. So I did. I did. I was epic on the balance beam, by the way, and that's going to be my last gymnastics comment. 
but but I'll, I'll I I want to hear your story. Yeah, yeah. Relay it. Yeah. First, maybe I could you come on my podcast or we do a YouTube video and I teach you how to do well too. Yeah. Um. So I don't know when I started soccer. Probably it was around the same time. Yeah. So I did gymnastics, soccer, and then basketball at one point, and my mom was like, "You got to pick." Because she's driving you all around to all these practices. Yeah. Yeah. Driving me around, um, single parent salary, working two jobs. And um, thankfully, I picked gymnastics because that was just the most natural one. I'm not good with ball sports, like external things, throwing, coming at me. Like, there's not that coordination. But, like, me on four inches, cool, good. It's, it's like, still to this day. Um, ball sports are always a little tricky, too. Really? Yeah. I don't I know. know. Some people just, like, it's it's natural for them. The eye-hand coordination, if that doesn't come easy, then you you better move away quickly, I yeah. think. Yeah. But then there's the thing of, like, okay, I'm great at gymnastics, but then, like, I cannot dance to take my life. And that should be, like, all body, but I'm just, it's not there. So uh, started that. I don't know when I ended up choosing, probably around seven. And then uh, this was just, like, at a, at a rec center. And the guy who was running those or that program there, he noticed me and was like, he invited me to like the actual gymnastics gym. And then I think I went into classes there. I moved up from classes to pre-team and then pre-team to actually junior Olympic um, competitive team. You were on the junior Olympic team for the United States. Yeah. Now, what, a- what age is that? I was, I started competing at 11. So probably 10 was when I got on the that team. How insane is that to compete at that young? That's kind of late, actually. Like a lot of girls um, who actually ha- go to college or actually the Olympics, they're usually in JO, which is no longer called JO. It's called the Dev program, like developmental program. Um, they start competing at like six or seven. That's wild. I mean, I was playing basketball and competing at six or seven or eight, yeah. something like that too. <laughs> yeah. So okay. I guess it's the same. But we were just kind of running around with our heads cut off. Yeah, yeah. This is this is routine. This is discipline. This is strength training. Some of the girls who are in tops, um, like they do a lot of specific strength training, and like they're the best in the country. But they're like little muscular just tanks. Um, but yeah, and then I competed until fifteen, I believe, or just before fifteen years old, and I got to level eight, which is two levels below collegiate gymnastics. So I always wanted to go to college for gymnastics, but I was never good enough. And also the gym I was at, like we didn't even have a pit. So if we had to train hard stuff, it's just like send it or don't. <laughs> really? So you didn't have like a like a foam pit to fall into, which would save you if you landed on your head? Mm-hmm. Which is, that's an important like thing yeah. to have. And we asked uh, the owner of the gym, and it, it's just too much maintenance. Maintenance? Because you have to... Cause foam? The foam, foam is- yeah, because the foam like crumbles. Kids pick it, pick at it, and then you have to empty the whole thing. Things fall to the bottom. Coins, band aids, it's gross. And then like usually, but you get the the kids to do it. They go down, they clean it all out, and then you throw the foam back in. It's not that hard, but whatever. So I could- some people are just so lazy. Yeah, we didn't have a boys team either, and we never had adults because he didn't want. He might see this. I don't think so, but whatever. So then <laughs> there's um there was always the option of changing gym. But I never thought I could do that because I didn't want to do that to my mom. I make her drive further. Make her yeah, drive further. That's a tough. I also did um, uh, carpooling with like other teammates. Like their nanny or the mom would drop me off, and my mom would take us home, kind of thing. And yeah, I just always felt like no, I can't change gyms. I can't. I don't want to do that to her. Also, I had a bad attitude, which is so different because. I was always the one who got everybody extra strength for not trying hard enough. Um, and now I teach people strength and condition. And you seem very pleasant today. So walk me through this bad attitude. Yeah. 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 Where where did this come from? I, well, I still am very stubborn. Like, I don't like working for other people. That's why I'm an entrepreneur. I just, I, yeah, I just was, I don't like being told what to do. And when you're in gymnastics, especially in the 90s and early 2000s, that was before this whole revolution changed after all the abuse came out. So you were expected to just do as you were told um, and execute. And it was very, like, kind of communist-ish because of the Carolis who came from Romania. And they had success with it. Obviously, that's why they brought it. And then the U.S. continued to succeed. But there were so many, as we've 
seen the underlying issues that come with the abuse and the treating someone just as like another number or part of a team instead of an individual whose body doesn't do this, all the injuries, all the mental stuff, and then the sexual abuse as well with unfortunately a lot. But I, I'm grateful I didn't have too much of that. And I think because of my bad attitude, like I talked back to coaches a lot. So people just avoided you in general. I mean, I usually got sent out <laughs> to the spectator area. <laughs> so um, yeah, I think that is what prevented me from going farther. But I'm glad because I wouldn't trade being, you know, quiet for then having some kind of more serious abuse. Does that make sense? Yeah, this is interesting because, like, I grew up playing basketball. So it's a team sport. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's usually about 15 players on a team and then five play at a time. And then you have your reserves and things like that. And, uh, and yeah, I remember, you know, 90s you know, being, you know, not a lot of people like asked you how you were feeling or, mm -hmm. you know, cared too much about the individual elements of, you're just of your... It. You just don't want to do conditioning. Yeah. Cause you're whatever. Yeah. Yeah. You're... Mm -hmm. And yeah, very much a socialist kind of team first mentality, mm -hmm. which was always very important. But, uh, but yeah, I, I think, I don't know. I think, can we get caught up t these days too much in like caring too much about individuals? Like, I just feel like sometimes not everything needs to be talked about and obviously that's a really fine line to to yeah. walk on like because some kids really do need right that kind of shoulder to lean on mm -hmm. um but but then again i also know like because i coach for a long time too it's like yeah. if you start asking everyone all the time how they're feeling yeah there's no time to get the work done yeah no we we've gone from like one extreme to another extreme mm -hmm. Instead of just in politics, right. finance, and yeah. in sports, yeah. yeah, it's crazy, right? I studied this in college too when social media was coming out. Like we had to do a report on like what is a meme, like when it first started coming out. And so what social media has done because you can block people, you don't want to see this, you don't want to talk to somebody who has a differing opinion. Um, you know, this makes you upset. It just does this, and so that you're seeing what you want to see, and because really. I would I would say a lot of this drastic change started around 2012 ish, I think. Around Instagram when Instagram came out. Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. um, and Facebook started realizing that they could they could really sway a lot of things. Because um, before that, like in I think you said this in Jason's um, episode was like in high school when I was in Model UN debate sometimes you would have to go to a debate and you would have to debate the opposite side of what you believed in but you you had to do the research and you had to to feel all all, all of the support for what somebody else believes i don't know if that still happens doesn't seem like it still happens um but yeah i think when we started doing this going from here to there to get back to your question is I think there, there is that balance. I'm very moderate with a lot of things. Like my last name, Gray, nothing's black or white. But it is important to not invalidate an athlete's feelings or thoughts or injuries. That's a huge one in gymnastics. Like I had tendonitis, thankfully. I didn't have any like major injuries in gymnastics, but it hurt to tumble sometimes. And then I was told, no, you're just being lazy. You don't want to... And tumble. tumbling's on the flat surface where you do the flips and the rolls and the jumps, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Okay. And all that impact, every time you, you have that impact, that's five times your body weight on like a 14-year-old's growing body. Yeah. So it hurt a little bit. And instead of giving me something else or drills, you had to push through, which then could cause more injuries. And then you're taking... Was there anyone there like helping you with strength training around the gymnastics because in basketball we always had like weight room sessions we always had because because your your body takes an absolute beating so if you don't build up the muscles around the joints and around you know the bones and stuff like that then mm -hmm. you're just asking for injuries yeah. right yeah exactly exactly yeah um no that doesn't happen in gymnastics it might happen more so now there's a guy called dave tilly and he does a great job with explaining um like gymnastics strength and mobility, but that didn't exist. And we would have conditioning sessions. We would have dance. We would have stretching. 
but weight training never starts until college back then it didn't yeah. and then collegiate gymnasts would do it but it's yeah it i remember we would have to do like straddle jumps or split jumps with ankle weights on that doesn't seem safe that seems painful that's it it was very painful and then if you go too wide and you kind of it feels like you tear your, tear your groin but you have to keep going like that's always fun i don't know i'm sure they still do some kind of that like with bands like having that resistance but yeah, the ankle weights probably wasn't very smart. We also used to sit in, on each other's knees. I've seen that before, yeah. Um, and and push on toes, like a lot of that stuff, especially in rhythmic gymnastics, is very important just for your performance. But it's um it's the level of, hey, okay, take a break if you want to come back in, you can. Giving the athlete that say for their own performance versus forcing them to do something, them resenting the sport quitting, leaving, and then that takes, I'm just talking about females specifically, then that takes girls out of sports, which that can cause so many issues, and a lot of girls drop out of sports by 14. Really? That seems way too young to be, like, giving up your sporting career. Because at 14, you don't know shit, and you're still trying to figure out, like, yeah. who you are. Exactly. Forget about who you are as a, you know, on a path to being a semi-professional or collegiate athlete. Yeah. It, a lot of it is about... um body image i mean did you watch the super bowl yesterday i did watch parts of the super bowl i didn't okay. sit and watch the whole thing but I, okay. I, I i caught bits and pieces so there were some commercials um that dove did about girls in sports oh really i didn't see these yeah i just saw michael Sarah's uh, face cream one and i was because he's he's alert he's canadian i love him he's great he's he's a goober but yeah i mean dove was doing um some stuff about females in sports and keeping them in and um, just, it's not, I, I try to tell clients that I have now, it's like when you were doing a sport as a kid, you weren't swimming to have toned arms. You weren't doing volleyball to have, you know, like, like lean legs. You were doing sports because they were fun. You were good at it. You wanted to get better. And that's what like train like a gymnast. The whole idea is to get back to, you probably felt your best when you were a gymnast. You felt strong and capable and all of this. And We've just gone so into the aesthetic workout to look good, but you're fighting a losing battle because every day you're older, every year something is sagging, gravity is like, I'm hither, and you are just, you got to focus on what you can do. Agreed. Yeah, no, I think that's great. Yeah. I think, so here's one for you. So I played, uh, I played collegiate basketball. Okay. And, uh, and then after my career was over and I wasn't good enough to play professional basketball, I picked up, um, I, I played rugby all through high school and through college, but but picked it up a lot um, after my collegiate basketball career was over. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, I just played rugby because it kept me fit and I love the guys. Yeah. And, um, and it was like a social group, but the fitness and the games and the practices were enough to keep me ruthlessly fit and I didn't need to go to a gym ever. Right. Um, I think we played, we had like two or three practices a week in one game. And I never had to lift a weight or worry about right. a thing. And then now that that's all over, as I get older, yep. now all I do is go to the gym and try not to be fat. And it's kind of like boring. You know what though? But in so for example, it is definitely a little boring. It depends on it depends on where you go though. Some some gyms and some coaches are, are better at motivating and <laughs> keep it keep it fresh. Like a studio, yeah. Like if you're in classes, you're just, yeah. Okay. But if but if but I like I know for a fact that myself. At my age, with my body, I cannot, I could not get out on a field or in a gym and move the way I did like 20 years ago. I would break, mm -hmm. a, I would break things like Achilles tendons, you know, I'd, I'd, they'd snap. Like, you know, there's definitely things that um, I couldn't, uh, all the agility, right? all the things around like that ex extreme agility that a basketball player or a gymnast would have. Yeah. Those are all gone. Like so those are. Train like? L like one, but not one. So that's why I train like a gym. You don't have to flip and tumble. It's like, okay. That's the fun part. Yeah. I mean, it is the fun part. But if you train like those people with the, you know, um, conditioning, the flexibility, the agility, the perp the um, plyometrics, all of that, that builds your confidence and your body and your strength. And then you're like, okay, maybe I could. I've learned things as an adult that I could never do when I was in competitive gymnastics. Really? Yes. Uh, like like certain moves or yep. certain... like That I would, like, training three and a half hours a day, five days a week, 
unable to do these things. And now as an adult, it makes more sense. I have more body awareness. Well, yes, some and some other, <laughs> some, some's changed. Um, but those things, some things I've been able to improve and get better as an adult. So while you feel like, yeah, I'm not able to move the same way I did as like a 15-year-old or a 20-year-old, there are things that you know now with life experience and with understanding your background that could give you an advantage to then do other things that you maybe couldn't do before. Doesn't mean go straight zero to 100, but prep yourself like you used to and it's hard when you don't have any organized sport you don't have a coach telling you what to do and a lot of us athletes we were told what to do and we did it so when you don't have someone keeping you accountable or watching you or telling you what to do you're like uh, yeah I could do a little of this a little of that but you just plateau because you're not pushed past where you would be normally or you're on your own I think I'm gonna bounce this idea off you and I'm curious to hear yeah. your your response I think when you're young the people, men and women or, or whatever, the, the, the people out there who end up being the best athletes, who train the hardest and who achieve the most later in life, mm -hmm. end up being the ones who can like switch off a part of their brain when they're training, where they're not thinking about themselves, where they're not thinking about themselves individually. Or, or maybe they're just thinking about themselves so individually that they don't care about anything else in the world. Like there's a, mm -hmm. I feel like there's a, there's like a button that you push, which like increases selfishness and, but also, you know, kind of empties the brain of everything else. I'm thinking of like Tiger Woods when he was like five and his father standing over him, you know, watching him hit a hundred shots, you know, drives, but you yeah. know, in the morning before breakfast. And then he gets to have breakfast after he does a hundred or, or something crazy like that, where yeah. the kids just buy into the point where they've given up their kind of individual individuality. Yeah. I see a lot of that. Yeah. That can get dangerous, but because that's what happens in gymnastics yeah. a lot. Um, but yes, like if you can find a sport that puts you it puts you in a state of flow by checking high, like you are not thinking about time, you're not thinking about um, what you did, what you've got to do. The challenge meets the level of concentration that you're doing. So if something is too hard, you're very aware that oh this is hard. I'm trying to get better at this. But if it's too easy, you could be thinking about, okay, what am I going to eat later? But you have to find a sport or an activity that challenges you just enough to the point where you're concentrated and you're only thinking about that. That that puts you in the flow. Like, oh, I've been doing this for three hours. I had no idea. Like that, Being in the flow is epic. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's what I want more people to find. What's your trigger for realizing you're not in the flow? Because I've got one. Like, so if I'm working out or training and I look up at the clock, yeah, then I know I'm not in it. Yeah. Because I'm thinking the about what I need to do next. Yeah. Exactly. But if I if I go through like a 60 minute session with a coach mm -hmm. and I haven't looked at my clock or my watch once, mm -hmm. then I know I'm totally You're just focused on survival. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, let me get through this to the end. Yeah. Pretty much that. If you are thinking literally thinking that is that is a trigger too if you're thinking about time if you're thinking about um you know how many more this or that if you're thinking about how many more most likely it's too hard so bringing the number down or lowering the weight whatever um you want to not you don't even think about emotions when you're in flow you're not thinking that you're happy this feels good it can it can still feel like yeah i, I feel good but that's not flow so did you have any family members that were um, performance athletes or anything like that when you were growing up that you could like learn from? I uh, no. My mom played tennis. She I think she did some volleyball. She roller skated. But my family was very musical. Oh, that's that's that requires a ridiculous amount of yeah. discipline. Yeah, yeah. Like my mom has perfect pitch and she still writes songs and plays piano and everything. And I and I believe kind of the reason I got into gymnastics was I think she always wanted to do it and my grandfather like wouldn't let her because she could potentially break her fingers and that would sacrifice her like or hinder her piano skills wow that's yeah that's interesting yeah so my family very much like a lot of them went to USC uh, my grandpa taught at USC at just very musical choir my aunt she's retired now but she played um in Vegas shows on the strip like viola 
So totally different element. I did music too, um, but and my dad did martial arts like karate, but not like nobody was in college sports, I don't think. My cousin swam, but yeah, nothing like professional or super high level. Mm -hmm. Just kind of active. Because I feel like sometimes a lot of those lessons get passed down like from generation to generation. Like my dad was yeah. in the Olympics, and okay. I used to hear stories about how they used to train. And I'm like, well, it's not that bad. Yeah. It's not that <laughs> bad, right? Like, you know, because he was, um, what sport? He was in water polo, 1972 Olympics, but he would tell me about, you know, training sessions in the 60s and 70s. Yeah. Which just seemed brutal compared yeah. to my university career, which happened mostly in the 90s. Mm, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have learned from particular, like, certain family members what not to do um, or how not to to do things and be and... um you know, you can you can learn both ways. You can learn from what not to do, and you can have someone as an example. Um, you know, I have friends who have famous parents, and they have followed in their footsteps and, and learned that way. Um, and then I have people who are, like, completely opposite, or they don't have a relationship with their parents, and they've been successful in their own way. So it's very interesting to, to see how... It doesn't always matter where you came from, but it definitely has an impact. Like you can be as equally as successful as someone here. You just have a different way of going about it. And I think it's, I think you're right. Like we're all on our own um, schedule. Like we all have our own schedule. We're on, all, we're all on our own timeline, right? Mm -hmm. You know, some of us uh, reach financial success at 20. Some of us reach financial success at 50. Like, yeah, I'm still waiting. You don't, it, it just, it just, yeah, it just. Or, or, or some level of, you know, whatever the goal is, like, right. I, like I want to be in a Broadway play. Like, right. And then sometimes that happens for k kids when they're 20, and sometimes it, it doesn't happen until you're 45. Like, you just have no idea when it's going to hit. Right. As long as you're doing the thing that you love, yeah. then, then it's like... You'll eventually get there. And, yeah, I mean, I feel it. I, I'm big on comparison. Like, it drives me nuts. And I... So I'm 11 years younger than Jason. So I don't know if he, he mentioned the age gap, but... I don't even know how old Jason is. He's 42. Okay. Um, and I'm 31. So okay. I think he mentioned this this TikTok we did or this video on Instagram where I posted like a picture of both of us in 2005 and he was in Iraq and then he got all the hate or whatever. I do remember that. It was a bit triggering for him. Yeah, yeah. And so for me, I was like, I was 13 on vacation in the summer or whatever. And, um, and so... I grew up in a time where I remember no internet and I remember, you know, dial up and I remember just playing with friends and stuff outside. But then I also remember the growth of social media. And I've, I've been cyberbullied since I was 11. Jesus, that's a, yeah. long, that's a long time. So, I, yeah, and I can't even imagine what kids these days are having to go through. Like, yeah, it, it really affected me on MySpace as a 12 year old telling me to like fix my eyebrows. And then I started threading my eyebrows back then. And, you know, there's, there are a lot of things that, um, that I think we need to, pro we need to protect, but we need to expose ourselves to at the same time. And, right. and I think, um, you know, that age gap where I experienced that as a kid and, he didn't have to deal with it until later is very interesting because we can have these conversations. Um, and I'm actually speaking to a group of uh, girls soon about their online identities and that comparison of how we have different, we can see people doing things that we want to do. And okay, maybe they had a fast track. Um, but the timeline is not set for anyone but because of social media we are seeing other people's timelines which we weren't seeing as in our face so then that comparison and the negative feelings about ourselves and where we're at just perpetuates of like why aren't i there yet why haven't i done that yet if they can do it this and that and to have all that happen when you're like still forming your own identity of like who you are at the age of 13 or 15 or 17 is just yeah. miserable because I, I i ended up actually making it all through university without really 
I mean, we had like email, but that was really it. Right. And and we didn't have mobile phones, and we definitely didn't have. And the, for the one or two kids that had phones, there were no cameras on them. So right. Right. The amount of crazy shit that I did in university that didn't get recorded. I can't even imagine, because like I'm from the the generation that like you would upload 200 pictures to a Facebook album after a weekend. And what were we doing? Um, but yeah, I mean, so so there's the difference there, like. I remember a time without phones. I remember a time without, with phones without cameras too. But my first phone, I think I was 11. My mom gave it to me because it was. Was, her- was it a Nokia? Yes, it was. It was. It was a Nokia little brick, and, it, and it, you could change the like face plate, you know, for the different colors. I had one of those too. I think I might be going back to one of those at some stage. I'm just so ready. I literally just applied for this thing that Siggy's is doing. It's like um, to not use your phone for an entire month, and they'll pay you ten thousand um, dollars. Just give me a reason. So well, that's why I love this so much because yeah. um, I was so I I had like a three hour mega session with a friend a couple of weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, his name is David, and we and we drank some whiskey while we were here and mm-hmm. whatever. And it and we and then when we finished, we went outside uh, just to the little room there, mm-hmm. and he was just like, "That's the first time I think I've spent three hours off my phone, like, and I can't remember how long, like, and it's just because." You turn off your phones, you come in here, you look someone in the eye, and you have a real chat, right? And he was just so taken by like yeah. how relaxing it was and how much fun it was yeah. and how rare it is to like actually connect with someone without also checking mm-hmm. your phone every like, two Oh, look at this. Or, uh, yeah, yeah. I just... Funny. I just watched a TikTok about this yesterday. <laughs> but he has you put down your phone and close your eyes and listen to what he's talking about. And... You know, he's talking about it's like a weekend morning and you you're bored. And this is something I've told Jason about his daughter, too, is like. It's OK for her to be bored, like she can sit there while you're working, you know, you don't have to put her in something or give her something to entertain herself, like let her figure out how to be bored. And like kids, I kids these days don't know how to be bored, but we don't either. Yeah, we're we're so uncomfortable with sitting there like I don't work out with music. When I'm driving, I'll turn off the radio sometimes. And you people... want to listen to this podcast while you're driving? No, I didn't know in three hours. Um, but I just people think I'm crazy. And it's like learn to be with yourself. I think that's beautiful. Uh, so I started to learn how to be with myself. Yeah. After university, when I started hiking and climbing, so I started doing a lot of like outdoor adventure stuff. Right. And uh, obviously, that was my way of disconnecting. You know, connecting with nature actually was yeah. my big thing. Sleeping outdoors in a tent, mm-hmm. um, sleeping with the natural rhythm, rhythms of the earth, you know, going yeah. to bed at 6.30 p.m., waking up at 5. It's amazing, right? Yeah, just go to bed, yeah. Yeah, it's like, okay, there's no sunlight anymore. Oh, no, it's, and then it's like daytime. And I'm, because, yeah, I don't, like I was saying, like I don't use any, I don't do supplements really. And I only use melatonin if I'm, I'm like traveling or I really can't sleep, but. Yeah, once it's dark, that's kind of why I hate the winter because I'm asleep at like six or eight and it feels like it's midnight. But it is it is something beautiful that I really want a lot of my clients to figure out is trusting their bodies and not you not depending or relying on these substances to like get you to do something. It's okay to be tired as well. Like you don't need caffeine every day. Like it's okay to be tired and yawn. Like people think yawning is so rude. I don't know. It's like you you yawn. You're human. I, I love I, you. I love yawning, and that way it gets contagious, especially with cats too. You ever see like a cat you yawn? Say it. You can say yawn to a cat too. Yeah. I don't know why, but I've gotten my cat a couple times, and it's really. Okay, so let's take this back. So you're 15 years old. Yeah. You are on a track to being maybe a collegiate yeah. gymnast. Mm-hmm. And but uh, so you, so what happened there? Manhattan Beach. You're a gymnast. You're like 15 years old. And did you quit or just realize like the collegiate path wasn't? Can you even get a scholarship for being a gymnast? Oh, yeah. so there's a whole like yeah. NCAA ecosystem for yeah. scholarships and. I wanted to go to UCLA for gymnastics, but also UCLA didn't have the major that I wanted. Um, and there are very few gymnastics schools anymore, um, especially on the West Coast. So like one that one of the girls that went to my gym that she went to, that doesn't exist anymore. So what happened? Which which schools would have like the best gymnastics programs like back back in the day? Walk, like because I because every school has a basketball program. Every school has a football program. Yeah. Basically. 
Um, for gymnastics, I was really looking at, like, I wanted UCLA, University of Utah. Um, Washington was, was okay. Uh, Berkeley. But I was like, I can't. There's no way I can get into Berkeley. Um, and then, but I was looking on the West Coast, right? So then um, nationwide, Florida Gators are really good. LSU is really good. Arkansas um, is really good. I think it's a lot like SEC. Um, yeah, because they have all those like massive cheerleading programs too, right? And there's some yeah. overlap there with the gymnastics program, I think. Because you see, you, I, th- I think there's actually like a series on Netflix all about like cheer, cheer, yeah. cheer squads, and yeah. they look, they all look like gymnasts. Yeah, I mean, there's a certain extent. There are competitive cheer people who say cheer is not a sport. I don't. I don't understand you, but um, cheer is a sport. It is competitive. It's just, it, they're different. Just like dance is different from gymnastics, cheer is different from gymnastics. There are gymnastics elements in cheer, but like my high school, they wanted me on the cheer team, and I was like, I can't smile that much. I'm sorry. I can't. Life, no. life is too heavy. I can't. It's just, yeah. The, again, being told what to do. I'm like, no. I'm not going to smile for three hours during a football game. Exactly, exactly. So uh, what happened was... I feel like I just started to get burnt out. Um, You know, like, I started to realize at that age, wait, if I'm 15, like 14, 15, and I'm a level 8 now, and I might not move up, and I can't train skills above my level because we don't have a pit, we don't have, like, the best coaches, that kind of thing. I was like, I don't think I'm going to make it in time. So what level would you have to be at to to compete for, like, a NCAA scholarship? You would... You need to be level 10, um, ideally a level 10 for at least a year or two to that, to even be like considered by a D1 school. Um, and so I was I was getting close to it, and I was like, they, they start recruiting when you're like sophomore, junior year looking at you. And I'm like, I'm not even there yet, so I don't think that's a possibility. And I was like, I can't change gyms now. I want to kind of get into acting and theater and stuff like that. And so I was like, okay, I guess it might be time. But I wasn't, I wasn't prepared for it to be done the way that it was. Uh, my coach was like, okay, why don't you take two weeks off, like regroup, come back, see if you want to keep doing it. I took two weeks off. I remember being on the phone with her in my room, and she said, I don't think you should come back. Oh wow, that's a nice, uh, nice. That's a nice exit. Yeah. So I had my last night. Everyone signed my shirt. I still have that shirt. Um, and that was it. I had all my routines for the next season. I didn't get to compete, um, though. And I so I didn't know my last competition was going to be my last competition. Oh. And 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 so you just so there was was there an opportunity to go to another gym or to join another program or was that just like your writing on the wall where it's like time to do something else with my life? Yeah, I think I mean I was pretty much done there. And then I remember my, my mom being upset with it too because of course like as a single mom it'd be great for me to get a scholarship into college and so all those years of her paying for that I'm sure she felt like was a waste but it's not because I think that's what my journey had to have been to then do what I'm doing now oh the discipline though that you must have learned during those years like there's so many like there's beyond just yeah time management effort communication like all these things that uh, like for me playing team sports has been huge right because I Mm. know how to work with people and communicate with people and at least I try try I'm an individual sport for a little bit harder perhaps yeah Uh, yeah I mean because because a lot of who I work with are the ones who didn't get as far as they wanted to in their sport. They, Which is everyone. I mean, every, like 99% of people don't get where they want to in their sport. Exactly. Like, when I was playing soccer, I wanted to be like, I guess, Maradona, which is strange because he's dead and a cocaine junkie. But uh, but yeah, but like professional, you know, hockey was huge in Canada. Everyone yeah, wanted to be Wayne right. Gretzky, right? Right. Or, or some version of that. And that's, yeah, the majority of people that is it and so like that's that's my audience of who I want to work with is yeah get back into that feeling it's okay you didn't make it but what I realized during COVID when I was just trying to do everything we kind of leaned in a little too much to the gymnastics world which I think intimidated people because they're not like oh I can't flip I can't do my splits I can't touch my toes yeah that doesn't mean you can't still train like a gymnast um and so like when you're when you're in this stage of 
I didn't get as far as I wanted to. There's still a little fire there. It's like a little passion. Maybe you want to go back and try something or make a comeback or whatever. But the ones who did collegiate or Olympics, sometimes you're burnt the fuck out. I was totally done. And by, yeah. yeah. Like, so I've talked with a lot of gymnasts about T lag. And they're like, I never want to train like a gymnast again. Yeah. Because that means something different for them. What's T lag? Train like a gymnast. Oh, okay. That's just the abbreviation for the for my company. And so I get it. Like, they are not my demographic. I'm not trying to, to train collegiate and Olympic gymnasts again. Unless you really lose yourself and you want to get back to, you know, to what you were feeling before. I'm trying to go for the people who still have a love for the sport or always wanted to do it but never could or their parents didn't let that like that those kinds of people um for that genuine love of it because adults turn into kids when they do gymnastics it's so funny like literally the same reactions if they get a skill it's like you just see them turn into a child and so that's the cool thing i just spoke with athleta hopefully to lead like a class in their in their uh store soon but i can train kids and adults everyone starts somewhere there's always a way to modify something there's always a way to make it work and that's the beauty of gymnastics because all you need is your body like yeah there are different events and there's different equipment but a lot of it like a handstand doesn't take you can just do that you can just whip those it out are, those are hard they're hard but you can train them if we could have three-year-olds doing dinosaur kicks i could have you start training a handstand it's oh my god i gotta tell you this one time it's like 2005 or 2006. I'm dating myself massively here, but I was working for the New York Times covering uh, in China. Mm -hmm. uh, I was a freelancer, actually. I didn't just work for the New York Times. but uh, So this assignment came down the pipe from uh, Der Spiegel, a German magazine, mm -hmm. and we had to go to uh, Wuhan, which is this major city we in know. central China, which is famous for the COVID outbreak. But, but, um, but oh, was it Wuhan? It might have. Yeah, it was, I think it was Wuhan. Um, and we went to a gymnastics school. And this gymnastics school was famous for um, for being like the the building blocks of the Chinese gymnastics. Uh, uh, no, um, but these were like these kids were like five, six, seven, eight years old, right? And then we went there and spent the day with them, and it was insane. Like these kids were walking on their hands yeah. for like thirty minutes, just like walking around the mat in circles in unison, follow the leader, and they were like six. Yeah. And I was just like, what the hell is going on? Like, all these kids had 12 packs. Right. That's and they, yeah, and they're, they're all fully, like, their muscles are fully developed. Yeah. They're jumping. They're flipping. They know exactly where they are in the air all the time. And, and it, it, was, it was incredible. Yeah. It was one of the most amazing things I think I've ever seen. I got a chance to photograph it because I was, I was there doing the assignment. But I'll yeah. never forget that. Yeah. Americans don't quite train like the Chinese. Well, there's, the, there's, this, there's that individuality thing, right? Like... Sometimes, sometimes in individual sports, Americans excel because Americans are, they have this individualistic attitude yeah. at the, at the collective sports. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's. But in the nineties, it was, it was, it was like China's training in a sense. Um, but like, I remember growing up looking at, uh, the Romanians. I love the Romanians. The Russians were always good. Chinese were always good. And Americans, and those those are the four that usually just like, kind of, just trade spots. But like, those are all the ones that train that way. That ruthlessness. Mm -hmm. So so at fifteen, your gymnastics career is over. So what was it like finishing high school as a non-competitive gymnast? It was it was interesting. So so I'm dating myself here. Graduated in 2010 high school um so uh, let me see what was I doing then I don't think I had started judging yet but I was still involved in gymnastics I still liked it like I was doing I was doing tap I was doing musical theater I was you can dance come on you just told me a couple choreographed specific so you can move when someone tells you how to move. But... In a sense, but it's not my best work. Um, but like when I get these auditions nowadays, like just dance a little bit and I'm like, can you do it? I just break out the Ted Lasso, you know, where he does the running man. God. <laughs> I just, I'm, I, it's mortifying. So uh, I don't know. It was, it was all good, but like I didn't work out 
anymore. I gained 15 pounds like right after I retired. And I was like, oh, I guess this is what just happens when you leave a sport is you gain weight. Not realizing you can sustain or maintain, but I did go. Was it stress eating or was it just depression? Because I, I got depression. so depressed after my career ended. I, because I had something else, it shifted my focus. So I didn't go into a depression, thankfully. I think people go into those depressions after co college and after like pro or Olympic stuff. Um, when it's recreational and you're, and you're still a kid and you shift focus versus just dropping everything, it can help. Um, because I did have a family, a community, but they were just drama people. Um, so, but you know, I was a little, I was a little inflamed, a little puffy. Um, and then I missed the sport. And then I, after graduating, I started judging and I started coaching. So to be in touch with it, I still like would go to the gym and like train and play around sometimes, but to really get back involved with it, I started coaching at the gym that I left. And then I ended up judging some of those kids for a while in college for side money. Um, and then I would train, you know, some more after my shift. So I, I was always someone who kind of like kept my skills as best I could. Um, and you seem to shift like pretty seamlessly into coaching, which, which I think is not an easy thing to do because, you know, not every competitive yeah. athlete understands what it needs, what you need to do to communicate with a child yeah. to make them better and make them feel good about themselves. Right. True. I mean, yeah, I've always wanted to be a coach or a teacher like if you look back at my stuff so it was very natural and in elementary school at recess I used to host like little gymnastics classes down on the playground like that is me um again not being told what to do but telling others what to do um there's a theme building here yes right yeah yeah so it was pretty natural and I did that until like 2017 maybe at that gym so where were you? Where, so what was your USC experience like? Because that's like, I mean, what was your university experience like? Because you didn't do gymnastics there. Right. So I, I lived at home and I could, well, my first year in college, I was at Santa Monica College, just doing all my general eds, getting it out of the way. And then I transferred. I've been thinking about college since seventh grade. So I knew all the articulation agreements and everything. I was ready to go. So I transferred after my first year to USC, still was commuting from home, only my senior year did I live on campus and all throughout the USC time, not the SMC time, I every semester put a physical education class in my in my schedule intentionally because I knew if I didn't have it, I wouldn't move. So I got a variety. I did self-defense. I did yoga. I did stress management. I did weightlifting, which really was very interesting because in gymnastics, they don't teach you kinesiology body mechanics like it's okay stretch a quad like I didn't know we have four quad muscles and three hamstrings muscles and like what works what does your tricep do like the things that could help you perform better and you're using your body like you don't know those things it's just mind-blowing to me so you were able to actually book in those classes as a student at USC and get credit for taking like weightlifting classes yep. and body combat and all this kind of stuff that's wild. Yeah. And like one, of, I think I was injured for one of them. So I just did like a pass, no pass instead of a like A, B, C, D, whatever. And I should have just done it because like, I don't know. I didn't do so. So because I was in gymnastics, the last time I did PE in like regular school was sixth grade. And I got a B in PE because I hate running and I'm not a good swimmer. And you don't like people. Exactly. Yeah. So, so yeah, I had a B in PE because my first mile was 14 minutes. And um, swimming, I had to have my own lane with my own. <laughs> Just not a good time. And then I was able to not do PE because I trained in gymnastics enough. Like my coaches could sign off. So I didn't, I didn't do, I just had to like test once a year or whatever. And then so in college, I was like, okay, scheduled this in. They'd be like one to two unit classes. So not crazy intense. Um, Did you have the idea like? In college, like, hey, maybe I want to be a professional coach or a fitness coach or some kind of instructor, yeah. or you were just taking this stuff just to move and make sure that you stayed fit. Yeah, it was that. It was, there was no thought of me being a coach at all. Like, maybe just, like, on the side, because I was still coaching then. Because um, my major at USC was public relations. So I'm PR marketing background. Um, originally, I wanted to do film studies, and then it kind of shifted because... I've always liked video production and things like that. But. And USC has one of the best okay. film study schools in the in the country, right? Uh, USC and NYU, right? I yeah. Think. yeah. Yeah. So I 
because I didn't get in out of high school, but then I did, uh, I got in as a transfer, but they only accepted me to the school, not to PR. And because USC is a private school, I appealed the decision, wrote a strongly worded letter, and I was like, there are people you accepted who USC is not their top choice. USC is my top choice. I will gladly take their spot. And then they accepted me. So never take no for an answer right. or like a, like a, but now in this whole world of, sorry, hold on, like the me too. Yes, no means no, but also where it's like a, it's like a, a conditional no, appeal it if you can. Remember private schools, private schools, you can appeal. So. I didn't yeah. know that you could do any of that, actually. A lot of people do. Yeah. So I'm, I'm learning from you. Yeah. So I, then I got in for PR. Um, so that's my background there. I always thought I was going to be a publicist, maybe in the entertainment industry. Um, and then I had an internship where I was working at a PR firm, and I was folding paper in half in the back room in a windowless room and going to get people lunch. And I was like, what am I learning? Nothing. And um, so that kind of shifted. Like, I don't want to do that. Um, but those first jobs are the best though, aren't they? Oh, good they, Lord. They're the best, they're the best stories. Like I, I yeah. was chatting with a friend the other day and he was like, for the first year he worked at a production, like this is a oh. NYU trained editor mm. for his whole first year he worked at a production company. All he did was get coffee and lunch. I mean, I get it. Work your way up. But also like I am value, valuable, put me to work with what I do know. Like, let me help. Yeah, because you're creative on day one. Like, you don't yeah. have to wait a year to say what's on your mind. Like, yeah, you yeah. already have ideas. Uh, yeah. yeah. It's just so confusing for me. But I don't like it here, actually. I might leave again, go away for another 25 years. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm so, I'm so close. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so that's, I mean, I realized what I didn't want to do. Um, I think that's also really important. Like mm -hmm. learning what you don't want to do is just as important yeah. as learning what you do want to do because yeah. you do have to like take some pieces off the board as you get older because you can't do everything all the time. Mm -hmm. So you really do have to be like, oh, I don't like that. Right. And and be able to like clear it away so you can refocus. I think that is hugely important. Like for anyone out there who yeah. who wants to try something but they're not sure they're going to like it, yeah. just do it. Exactly. Because like, not knowing is just as valuable. Totally. Like if you're, especially if you're like a teenager or you're in your early 20s and you are like, I don't know what I want to major in. I don't know what I want to do. Try different things. Do I different studied things. international politics. Oh, wow. Got me traveling though. The, yeah. Yeah. If you can do, if, if you can study abroad as well. I did that in college during the summer, not for a semester, but during the summer we did one week in London, Paris, Rome, and Prague, and we met with all these different media agencies like BBC and Channel 4 and uh, the Vatican. I think we met with the Vatican. Um, and we had, yeah, we had these meetings and get that kind of exposure and experience as well, because you might find something in there you're like, oh, this particular thing I didn't even know existed. So... That kind of exposure is amazing. That's, yeah. That sounds like a great trip. It was. Yeah. And I'm grateful that my mom was able to make that happen. I think she finally paid it off. <laughs> I just, I don't know how she did those things. But um, travel has always been a big thing in my life and upbringing. She was a school teacher. So um, not dur not when I was growing up, but before. Um, and so like every year what I would be learning in the upcoming year we would travel during that summer to get the hands-on experience so like in fourth grade you learn about like California history and the missions and stuff like that and so the summer between third and fourth we did road trips to go see the missions um I think 10th grade was when we started learning world history so between ninth and 10th grade we went on a trip to Europe and do that kind of stuff. So that's that's fan that's well planned. Like that's a nice little way to very good. Yeah, plan. that's great. Yeah, very strategic. So if you can, if you have kids and you can know what they're going to learn, like definitely try to get them that hands-on experience because just doing it is going to teach them more than just being a memorization hub, like. I think I, I totally missed out on all this because I was so into basketball mm -hmm. that it, it it almost completely whitewashed my entire ex educational experience. Like mm -hmm. I read all the books and I right. passed all the tests and I have all the pieces of paper that say, mm -hmm. you know, yay, Ryan, good work. Yeah. But 
but I, I never really prepared for anything or, or really took it as more than just, okay, done with that. Now I can go back to practicing or, or I, yeah. or, you know, I, I beat the grade average, which will allow me to play next year, which was all that, you know, I yeah. really cared about. I, my, my, I was so into my, my collegiate uh, and, and high school, um, sports that I never really, I never really kind of bit off the big end and really jumped into the, to the edge. Did you travel though for, um, for, I'm going to say meets or not meets, um, games, basketball games, basketball? Yeah. <laughs> like competition yeah. meet. Yeah. 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 Just a regular game. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. 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 40 minutes to two 20 minute halves. Yeah. College basketball. Um, yeah, so we did, but we but mainly just traveled around inside Canada. Yeah, uh, we didn't really have like a huge budget to play teams in the United States, and, right. and they were much better than us too. Like a, a Division One Canadian team, like I played on at the University of Toronto, would <laughs> probably be like, or at least back then, maybe similar to like a Division Two team here in the United States. So we could never, we would never like fly to North Carolina and play Duke. Right, we would have well, gotten specifically that killed. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, specifically yeah. then. But I mean. Yeah, that's where a lot of things kind of nowadays we have to learn outside of sports and school. So on my podcast, I sometimes ask the the guests, um, what did sports teach you and what did sports not teach you? Which is like, you know, it taught me discipline, it taught me time management, it taught me how to work well with others. But what did it not teach you? Did it not teach you, you know, how how to apply certain things that you're learning in sports to other areas of your life did it not teach you how to train yourself like it's a very interesting conversation that a lot of people have never thought about too like doing gymnastics never taught me anything about my body just that maybe the pain that I was feeling was I'm making it up I think I think I think if you grow up at a, as a high level athlete you grew up super um insensitive if that makes sense I didn't really learn how to care about people. And I don't know if that, uh, yeah. and I, I'm going off a bit on a tangent here, but I don't know if that came through like genetics or whether it came from me just having some super tough coaches that never yeah. asked anyone how they felt ever. Yeah. And then, you know, and then you just end up going through life like, well, this is the job. We have to do it. I don't care if your foot hurts. We, yeah. we play through that shit. That's exactly it. That, that's literally, yeah, that's a perfect answer because your coaches, especially when you're growing up and you see them almost the same amount, if not more than your own parents. Oh, much more than my parents. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. They become the parents. And it's like that figure kind of takes on the role of what your parents are supposed to teach you. And if you're not learning those things, even being put into sports, that's what you're missing out on too. So it doesn't mean don't do sports. It means that coaches realize and recognize the role you play in a kid's life. And also, parents, you got to do a harder job or a better job at teaching your kids the things that sports are not going to teach them when they're at practice. I think we could all use a little more Ted Lasso in our life, right? I know. I've never seen it. I've seen parts, but, like, my friend loves it. And I know everybody loves it, but, like, I know what it is. And it's a tiered, yeah. It's And it's beautiful because, I, uh, so I love the show. And I love it because, um, because, uh, because of basically what you're just saying. Because here's a here's an a, an American football coach who travels to England to coach European football soccer, uh, and and he doesn't know anything about the sport. So all he does is teach these kids, these men, life lessons. Prof life lessons. That's and, right. Yeah. And it's so beautiful because he doesn't care about how they play soccer or how great their kick is or whatever. Yeah. He just wants them to be good people. And it's and it's this great confluence of of you know performing at a high level as a professional athlete where you have all this pressure mm -hmm. but also remembering you know you're one of 11 you're one of you know yeah. you're one of 11 players on the field you're one of the you know one of the team members you're also a brother a sister a husband a wife whatever and right. um, and that's you know that that role is just as important and i think yeah. that that gets totally lost yeah in this part of the world 100 percent. I, I think that's all i mean i don't know is that a very western way of thinking too like I don't know. I haven't competed enough in Europe. Like I know in the Middle East, sports actually isn't. I mean, maybe yeah. soccer, football. Like it's, uh, European football, soccer is pretty yeah. big in the Middle East. But yeah. I, I never, I've never seen coaching at that level. Yeah. Um, Asia is very top down in coaching. Like you, 
the players don't talk too right. much about who they are or what's going on. It's all about team, 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 yep. especially in China. Like the gymnastic stuff I saw in China right. and boxing too was crazy. I think it is, I think like that whole like Ted Lasso life lesson thing is kind of very American, but I think it's coming out of how crazy things were in my era and your era. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And then kind of like what we were talking about, where's the point where it's like, okay, we're not going to have too many snowflakes on the team because like we also still want to win. And then- Okay, so what's a Pardon? snowflake? Walk me through. With, what's a snowflake? Is this like, a, what, it's like a brittle, a brittle soul? No, no, no. Like, you know when, when a snowflake is so beautiful and then it lands in your head and it just melts? It's like, oh my God, everything in the world is ending and it just like melts. So, so the, that's a human condition? Yeah, yeah. The people who, um, you know, are kind of soft instead of brittle, like the softies. It's like, oh, my God. It's like that won't be able to push through certain things. Doesn't mean ignore your injuries, but it's like, listen to your body. Can you, you know, get through your routine? Can you get through this game? Or is this serious? Do we need to take you out and, you know, whatever? Um, Those are the toughest calls to make. Right. Where you have to take yourself out. Exactly. Mm. So that's that's where it's like, okay, are you just uncomfortable or are you in pain? That's something that I have realized as a trainer by training the general population and not athletes. Some people will say, this hurts. And I'm like, is it like muscle burning? Mm. Like you're using your muscles or is there pain? And the, it's hard for them to distinguish. Yeah. Well, people, the, the average people don't know the difference either between muscle pain and joint pain. Like two, yeah. like two muscles or two, two bones rubbing on each other or twisting and they don't understand the difference between where their muscles are and where their tendons are. Yeah. And how tendons can stretch and tighten. Let's talk about another thing right here that I, I, it drives me nuts. Certain things that t- should just be taught in school. Why is anatomy, human anatomy not taught? We can dissect a frog or a cat but not, we, not a cat, rat, rat, not a cat. Uh, some people dissect cats. I know. Oh, tough one. I tough, could. Tough, tough, tough one. I, I couldn't. couldn't do it either. I think that's more like med school. But yeah, we did frogs. We did owl pellets. Okay. Why don't we have human anatomy in like as a general ed requirement? Why do we not have like finances or like emotional regulation? Why do we not have nutrition, pellet, nutrition, nutrition? Oh, and this is I where hit, I hit a hot spot. Yes, this is where I was telling you in the in the beginning, like how the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. The gatekeeping of this information, yeah, because certain things want want us to stay unhealthy. So then we'll buy this and we'll buy this, and it's just why not? Well, the 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 dumber we are, uh-huh. the fatter we are, yep. and the more poor we are, yep. uh, the rich people win. Like that's just a fact. Exactly. Like because they own, they have well entrenched themselves in industries which we all need to access and which we need more of if we are unhealthy and not that smart or uh, or, or or wrongfully opinionated. Yeah, so it's like, where's the just doing stuff for the betterment of humanity anymore? Oh, there's, there's not, that's not, there's, there's like none of that. It used to exist, did it not? It never existed. Yeah. No, never. I don't think it ever really. I think all of this is whitewashed into um, making profits somehow. Like all this green energy transition and yeah. renewable energy transition, this is just feeding another yeah, we, industry of people who got in on the ground level, right? Right, right. It's like, oh, we forgot to buy ExxonMobil when it went public like 100 years ago. So if we start a green transition, we can get yeah. all into all these companies that are doing this you know, mm-hmm. from a start. Now, will it make the air cleaner yes will the earth cool down maybe maybe not depends on what you think about general trends in the environment we've lived in over the last couple hundred years but like but it's all like nothing is just let's make things better for us it always has a monetary value attached to it and i'm maybe i'm maybe i'm too cynical i don't know no i i definitely see what you're saying i'm just i was just trying to think if there was an example of something where i was where I was thinking, oh, so like curing things, the benefit of the the greater good, um, or like inventions that make things easier for people. Yes, like that. Those kinds of things make sense. As long as you sell a million of them and you own the patent, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's like I don't know. There are so many ways I could go. What you know, with just the just thinking about what we were talking about before of the like not being bored 
um, anymore and the just constant stimulation, I feel like why, why did we need to, why do we need to just, just bombard people constantly? Um, with screens. Why do we, yeah, every, with screens, like screens, ads, new billboards are showing up on sides of buildings that I've never seen. It's like, can't, we just can't have paint anymore. Like it has to be an ad. Um, I do like the, some of the artistic work that's done on yeah. those buildings and things like that. There's, there's some beautiful Kobe, Mural, Kobe yeah. murals all around town as well that, uh, that I, I drive past a new one like every couple of days and mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, I'm Kobe. Yeah. We miss him. Yeah. The, uh, the graffiti can get out Yeah, really far away. Um, and then, yeah, it's just, I don't know. I really don't know what's going to happen with the world in the next few years. I kind of just want to go live in a forest. Have you seen those stories about friends that are building like little neighborhood community we're, we're gonna all just go back to villages we're gonna be village people again we're just gonna get so tired of everybody we're just gonna go in our little our little pots and i think that's a general reaction to living in la in general yes that too i'm like who wants in let's make a little town where we just live off the land well you know those people who live in the venice canals Mm -hmm. They never leave that little area. They're just like... They got everything to tear. They do. <laughs> Even when the water is like mud. They, they got... Yeah. You can just walk around there. I don't know. It's... This is where I'm like, is there hope for the future? Do I want to just keep... Do you want to keep going? <laughs> keep, keep struggling? Keep fighting? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I think traveling is super interesting and super helpful. But it, but it does teach you that it's kind of the same everywhere. Like... Certain things are the same, yeah, same everywhere. Like, we just did a retreat in Bali last year, and that one was very much culture shock for me because that was my first time in, like, that part of the world. It's definitely Asia for beginners, Bali. Yes. Yeah. But for me, I've I've only really traveled to, to Europe, and I've seen that kind of, like, it's, I don't know. It is very, you know, like, there's a lot of Australian, a lot of, you know, New Zealanders and just random people from just, just coming in. But... For someone who's never been to that side of the world, too, it was just like, I don't know. I was, I was, because I got there alone, too, because I had to prep for my retreaters to get there. So everything was different. I got, I kind of had a little panic attack. Um, and then I got kind of comfortable with it. The only reason I would go back is for the people. Because the people are beautiful. The people yeah. are, yeah, they're amazing. And I, that's kind of why I have, um, a love for Hawaii as well, um, is, the people then you come back to LA and it's like why are you looking at me like why did you say hi but you go there and you want to to get to know the people it's... well Bali is a beautiful little hub because obviously Indonesia is a massive country right, and right there's thousands of islands in Indonesia and Bali is just one of them mm -hmm. uh, but um, Indonesia is a majority Muslim country and there's like 700 or 800 yeah. million people there which is crazy it's yeah I mean, being there for Nyepi was such an incredible experience too. Mm -hmm. They 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 closed the airport for everything. There's no light. There's nothing. Just anyway, sorry, to interrupt. It was just real. But uh, but Bali is um, a majority Hindu uh, island, so the mentality of the people and the way they treat right. people and the way they communicate with each other and treat nature is totally different from from the rest of the country so right it's a, it is kind of like a nice special little bubble yeah yeah it was it was very it was very cool i filmed in bali a few years ago i walked across the island we did an episode there for one of my tv shows yeah it was kind of nice the jungle there is pretty thick in places and then the, yeah. we ended up we walked from like one coast to another coast through like central bali and took in like mount batur which i think is one of the volcanic um mm -hmm. mountains there it was beautiful yeah it was it was very nice i got eaten up by mosquitoes um but other than that, other than that other than that it was it was good i just yeah i think travel is a very very big teacher like there were things that were there were elements that that were the same you know definitely seeing like the third world part of things and the resort kind of thing. even with fiji very similar place you know of you got these little hubs of money and then the rest is just you know third world um but I think if we can change our society's perspective and just humanity, maybe L.A. and America can be like a better place. I don't know. It's wishful thinking. It'd be so nice just to. Just to relax a little bit. To, uh, just to have like positive interactions with people. I feel like that's very 
I, I would like to see like more positive interactions like in the news media. I think that's where yeah. it starts, right? I think mm -hmm. we're all we all just kind of um, we're, you know we're just consuming news that negative. is so negative and so decisive. Yeah. Uh, not decisive, um, divisive. Like we're mm, divisive. where where people are being pulled apart instead of being yeah. brought together. I think that's, that's pretty yeah. pretty sad. Yeah. All, always. Get ready for this next year. War us versus them. Bring on November. Yay. I can't vote. I'm a Canadian. That's right. Yeah. You don't have dual citizenship? No. Okay. Yeah. I'm I'm like independent. So on my primary ballot, it was like, if you want the presidential candidates to be on here, let us know which party. I'm like, I, why can't you just give me all? Like, why do I have to ch mm. wish we had a third party that was just like, okay, you guys, let's come together. I feel like there are more moderates than extremists, but they force us to choose. It's just a very weird. Well, what's the what's the saying? It's the saying because uh, I st I studied U.S. politics too. So in university, it was part of my uh, international politics degree because the United States was part of the international community. Yeah. Um, so there's like there's like thirty percent of people that will always vote Democrat. There are thirty percent of people that will always vote Republican. Mm. Um, and then the 40% in the middle, the independents, they basically will have to choose one side or the other right. against their... Yeah, otherwise, right. you throw away your or, vote. Yeah, exactly. And and what happens going into those last few weeks is uh, is massive because it'll sway that middle 40% right. in one direction or another. So it's, yeah. it's, it's insane. So in 2016, when Trump beat Hillary Clinton, those those emails that came out, um, the email hacking scandal that came out against Hillary Clinton like a week before the election, um, totally handed it to Trump, right? So whatever happens in those last like two, three weeks is actually hugely important to those 40% that sway. But that's just my yeah college degree talking from like 25 years ago. I believe it. I just, I was telling Jason, like, it'll be so interesting because we know what's going to happen. This We know what's going to happen. By 2028, it'll be interesting to see who is in the mix because certain someone will be the end. And then it'll be, now what? And Jason's like, I don't think we're going to make it to 2028. <laughs> I'm like, oh shit, maybe. I feel like there's so much resentment and tension rising that we're going to have some kind of revolution soon. But you learn in history, you know, history class, like, oh, the Industrial Revolution, this and that, and and revolts, and you just don't think modern society would do that. But I think it's some something, something's gonna happen soon, and it's a little scary. Some some to shake things up, or some black swan event, or what do you think? No idea what it's gonna be, but I think people are getting tired of 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 bullshit, and some change needs to happen, like completely like i'm trying to work with the the um california surgeon general to get in contact with the uh education side so we can start to change some things in california's educational system but that needs a whole overhaul like the housing department like everything is just kind of we're here and i think there's like a ceiling that we're going to hit and stuff's going to crumble like society in general, he's going to crumble. That's why he's like, I don't think we're gonna, we're gonna survive for that. I know I definitely want to be out of LA by the time the Olympics get here in twenty twenty eight because that's gonna be a complete cluster. And I live right by LAX, so I don't even. Don't they? And twenty twenty six is the World Cup. That's what he was saying. Yeah. Mm. So maybe by twenty twenty six. So you you really are hoping for the the, yeah. You know, you know what I did is uh, I I was. During COVID, especially too, I was watching all these like zombie apocalypse TV shows. Um, as and I was just one does, at, at, as one does, and I was thinking like, and I was thinking like, man, how close are we to really like becoming a, a zombie apocalypse planet? I mean, obviously Elon Musk wants us to keep having babies and and become interplanetary. Yeah. Um, but um, but I think the big problem is is like we all don't like each other very much at this stage and more people is just causing more problems. And if we have less people, then it's like, well, maybe we don't have enough people to sustain interplanetary uh, adventures, but yeah. he, that's all very high level for Elon. But I mean, at the end of the day, like we're, we're, we're having huge problems just with the people we have on the planet already. Like, it's, yeah. it's not getting easier. Yeah. There was, I feel like there was something I saw recently about that. That was like, it's like the puppeteers kind of from above. If we're mad at each other, 
we're not going to get mad at them. Yeah. It's all distraction. Yeah. Like all politicians are magicians. So they show you something flashy over here, but actually they're doing something over here that they don't want you to pay attention to. And yeah. that's the that's the way the entire world works. But then with that kind of awareness then opens all of these people with the conspiracy theories and it's like, okay, bring it back, reel it back in a little bit. Focus on the mission. Like, why are you going way over here? I think any conspiracy theory that ends with following the money is not a conspiracy theory. Well, I'm talking about, oh, it was one that I heard. The people that don't believe in space. Like, like multiple planets in our solar system kind of people? Just like, like that is, uh, my friend Batch. Like yes. flat earthers? Are you talking about people who think the earth is flat? Like that's the firmament and like that there's not like stars and a galaxy and planets out there. Like that's just like, I don't know what they think it is. And like, but that they don't believe in space. Literally, I saw this. Uh, my friend Batch, um, he is a comedian. You might know him as King Batch. Um, he does stand-up comedy and stuff. And he, he did something and some girl said that. And I was like, this is a real thing. And so I was looking into it and there's like a whole, like, then there's like an ocean below the, I can't even remember. It was an, it was a wild graph that i was looking at so i'm like don't let's not let's bring back into like focus yeah i mean if if some things i mean some things are definitely easier to swallow than others yeah yeah when it comes to theories and conspiracies and whatnot yeah so i don't know i feel like we all we all want the same thing that i i try to say this and i feel like i'm very much like a mediator for a lot of relationships in my life and family members and then just like community in general we all want the same thing. We just want that thing differently, like in different ways. Yeah. So if we can just remember that, maybe we can work together. Like, yes, I get what you're saying. We could try this. We could try this. But we ultimately, we're, we're arguing about the same thing. Mm. Yeah, Jason had some uh, good feedback about that, too, just because of all his time abroad, about how people just want, like, safety for their families right. and, and, you know, to raise their children healthy and yeah. in a non-war environment. And, and yet we're just continuing to... Yeah. Blow shit. Blow. Or, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, because that'll help. Okay, so back to USC. You yeah. you graduate with a uh, with uh, a, a degree in, in public relations and a minor in consumer behavior from the Marshall School of Business. Nice. So how lost were you after graduating? Because I was totally lost. <laughs> so if here's the thing. My majors, I could kind of do anything. It wasn't so neat. Like my mom majored from, um, in piano performance. She's a business manager now. So, like, there are certain majors that are, like, so niche um, that when I did PR and consumer behavior, I could I could apply that to anything. And, and I ended up going into marketing. I did online marketing for a while. Is that freedom harmful or helpful? Because cause sometimes it's, like, nice to come out of university and go straight into a job. Yes. So they did ask these things, yeah. like, in the final semester. Like, okay, who has a job lined up? <laughs> and I would be like... The whole class has their hand raised, and I'm just like, I don't know yet. I got that job in June, so it wasn't super long. But yeah, graduating without a job is a little, it's a little scary, but it's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. I was there for two years, loved it, loved the people. Um, but then I was realizing, like, I'm stressing and doing all this stuff for other people when I know how to do this, and I could be doing it for myself. So I left that job, turned down a promotion, and went into kind of what I'm doing now. Is like. Um, personal training and the fitness world. This was like 2016, so influencers were just becoming a thing and all that. Um, but I didn't have a plan or a strategy. How hard was it for you to make that like entrepreneurial jump from having what what I would consider like a safe salary, safe job? But you were, mm-hmm. but you realized like, holy shit, I can just be doing this for yeah. myself. And then like that's a tough transition to make, and a lot of people yeah. don't. A lot of people think it and don't do it. Yeah, it's it's definitely scary. So. In two, so in 2015, I got my I got certified as a personal trainer. So I started training people on the side. I still had my full time job. I was still part time gymnastics coaching too, but I was realizing that I was p- forgetting to pick up my checks from the gymnastics gym. And I was like, hmm, if you forget, you get paid to do this. That's probably a passion you want to follow. So, you know, I stayed doing all three of those things for a while, um, and I had, you know, I had a savings um, and. I didn't just drop everything entirely. I did have kind of like a transition period. So it was easier to do because I still had stuff going for me and clients. 
That's great, though, that you were able to kind of graduate and still maintain, you know, your athletic pursuits, even though, you know, but through coaching and then Mm -hmm. through getting certified and you didn't have to kind of drop it cold turkey. Right. Yeah. I would not recommend just dumping everything and going into something else. Like always have an overlap, like start doing this thing you want to do while you're doing this thing. Um, that happened to me when I was working at Equinox, too. I, I started working at Equinox in 2016 because I was like, huh, I don't know how to get clients. I have no strategy. So I started working there as a trainer until 2019. And so train like a gymnast was always an idea, but I started doing it in 2018. And I was still doing Equinox. And then once train like a gymnast was making what I was making at Equinox, that's when I let that one go and I went full time into this. So there is a strategy and plan to it. Um, I never am someone who just I'm not a big risk taker, so I don't just drop. I'm like, I need the proof before and okay, now let's do it. So that's a nice way to do it. Like, yeah. I, so when I graduated the university, um, I was very lucky. I didn't have any debt, mm. um, so I was I was very thankful for that. But I didn't have any savings. I had, I think, I had like just a few thousand dollars, maybe, which is which was better than being in the hole a few yeah. thousand dollars. So I was I was I was quite nice. But I so didn't know what I wanted to do, mm. and I so didn't know. What I I already knew what I didn't want to do, okay, which was process of elimination. You get going, in there, but going to banking and finance and all this kind of stuff, which um, which my family had been in uh, essentially, yeah, and uh, and because I didn't know what I wanted to do, I, I decided I was going to go to China for three months, and like decompress. But, okay, and that turned into and that turned into yeah something just totally different. But it it got to the point where it was just like I needed to pull myself out of talking to people every day about what I was supposed to do next because I didn't have an answer. Yeah. So I thought the best, yeah. So I felt like the the best way to do that was to go to a foreign country where people can't contact me and just wander around, maybe learn some language, see yeah. something fresh, see something new, be in a new en- environment, do something hard every day, which was like taking the subway, or right? taking a train from one city to another. All of a sudden, like all of these things become like little challenges. Right. And it was nice to build that confidence back up again and then when I came out of China I was just like holy shit I just did like 90 days around China by myself like mm-hmm. I can I can take on the Toronto or the New York subway system or right right or, and it was it was kind of like an elevated sense of accomplishment just getting around a foreign country without any language skills but I also think like that like China and Japan too was the just living and thinking they're very much we are a part of nature and we exist just like a tree exists. The tree is not trying to be anything but a tree, but in the Western world, we're always searching for purpose and like, and well, what do you want to do? What are you going to do next? This, this, this versus living and you're here to live Mm -hmm. just like. But I think that's because the economic pressures on us are so high. Like everything's so expensive. Like living in Los Angeles is expensive. Living in New York is expensive. Like living anywhere. So so that right. idle time when you're not making money exactly is going to be a burden to someone, maybe your parents, maybe a spouse or something like that. So, so like not bringing in income, mm-hmm. it becomes more important than finding what you really want to do or who you really want to be, because that actually takes a lot of time mm-hmm. to figure out. Like, that's not like a weekend of meditation. Yeah. That's what I'm kind of in that transition right now. I'm like, okay, do I want to keep doing this? Do I want to kind of shift? And it's like, okay, just give me a day to like journal and think, but no, it's months and months. Um, so when's your trip to China? Don't really have a desire to go to China. Well, some, somewhere, somewhere. Oh, I do want to go to Japan at some point though, because I love the culture yeah. and the people and that. So that is, that is something I do want to do, but. I just sell China to everyone that wants to find themselves. I was like, are you struggling with who you are and what you want to do in life? Just go to China for oh, a month. God. I mean, because if you don't figure out exactly who you are by going to like a China or an India or somewhere like this, where like life is hard for the local people and you getting well, around is. Well, it was a little, it was, it was, it was an interesting perspective. I, that that helped, you know, just being in that completely different, like, like going to France. I speak the language, and so that that was it was just like a vacation. But Bali was similar to that kind of feel of very very different mm. um, language entirely, way of doing things. Um, so that's that's something I do. I would recommend too is travel somewhere that you have no idea what the. Yeah, it's crucial. I think like the best way to figure out who you are is to travel. Yeah. Cuz cuz then you put yourself into the, you see people from others per points of view and other perspectives and that kind of helps hone in on your own identity at some stage. 
So, so train like a gymnast. So how did you, how did you come up with this? I mean, you're, you're a personal trainer, you're a certified personal trainer. You could have gone in any kind of direction yeah. with this. What, what, um, what was this catch that, that made you, that made you passionate about getting people back in shape? Yeah. Um, I think because I was gymnastics coaching for like three, uh, maybe five years at that point. And then I had my desk job and some people would see me like doing gymnastics and stuff. They'd ask questions. I'm like, okay, yeah, like I would love to be able to train adults too. So that's when I got my, my certificate. But, um, I realized that I was always training people like a gymnast. I would work, you know, cardio warm up. We'd do a core circuit or something to prep and then we do a main circuit like the main event main, whatever we're working on that day and then we'd stretch at the end mm -hmm. and that was how i trained so i realized oh yeah you train like a gymnast okay that's a cool little idea so i got the domain i wanted it to become like a a gym i wanted to open my own studio and you know, lead classes and stuff and then i was like i don't really want that overhead no thanks and then that also puts me in one place and locks me down yeah so that overhead is terrifying i'm assuming yeah, that's I mean, huge. First and last and all the equipment and everything like yeah, that. Exactly. And yeah, people and it's a whole different ball game. And I, I'm I was like, Yeah, I don't really know if I want that. And then also that's just like your one little area. You can't reach that many people. So I continued to do a training with people, just personal training, and then with Equinox it gave me the access to a certain type of community to be around successful people. And it changed my way of thinking and I could bounce these ideas off of people. And I realized, yeah, I don't want to open a studio. I want to change more lives. I want to expand. Um, and so that's when I was doing that on the side. Um, and I was able to tap into people around the world. Like we had a girl from South Africa. We we have a girl, I think she's in the Netherlands. Um, we had some UK. We had a, uh, we had a Qatar. Um, so what oh. what part of this training is online and what part of it is face to face? Because I'm 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 behind you here. Yeah, there's a mix. So the way it originally started was it was like a 28 day challenge. People would join, they would bet on themselves a hundred dollars. Like if you can follow all these things for 28 days, you get your money back. If you don't, I keep it. So it was a little bit. Of oh, really? That's yeah. interesting. That's a that's a funny way to do it. Yeah. It, it, so it was like technically free if you did all the work, right? And then if you wanted to continue like this style of training, then right. that 100 is applied to your ongoing training. So that's how I did it for a while. And it was going great. Um, and then I changed the way I did it. And then, of course, I dissolved that entire online program end of 2019 because 2020, when I wanted it to be the year of everything in person. So you were going against the market and the pandemic in, Wait, entirely. I that that way if i had kept that whole system and pro i i don't even want to think about it i could have scaled so much more but um i did sell out of like my my equipment and stuff like i sell some workout kits but th that like i have an app it's an on like that's the online thing and i do virtual training with people one-on-one -on -one, um and sometimes i'll open up small groups but then i do one-on-one -on -one in person training I do um, mentoring sessions as well. And then sometimes I will lead like one day workshops, like pop ups um, where I can teach people hands on stuff and spot them or do those destination retreats. And we've we've done four um, so far. I don't know if we're going to do another. I've thought about it, but I'm not sure yet. Destination retreats where you just take people out for, you know, to some exotic destination and train them for a week and then come back to your normal life. Mm -hmm. And that it's a mix fun. of like gymnastics training, but also mindset training and personal development. So we've done Hawaii, we did Lake Tahoe, we did Park City, and then we did Bali. How much of your, how much of your platform is focused on mental health and and training the mind versus versus training the body because i feel like we're in a huge emotional mental crisis everyone is these days and and everyone's looking for something like that like i have a friend who swears by his meditation app and how it keeps him calm and i've never used a meditation app but uh, it seems like seems like something that might be fun um so on the app it's probably like 10% um, there's a section in there on mindfulness where I have I have some meditations and then I also have a six module personal development course with a whole worksheet like a whole workbook with worksheets that you can do um, 
by the way, that's free in the app, but it usually goes for four ninety seven. So if you like want it to be free and actually do it, then just download the app. It's free for a week, and then anywho. Uh, What's the app called? Is it? So you can't get it on the app store because it's through another platform. So you go to trainlikeagymnastapp.com and then you can download it through there. It'll tell you how to do it. That's great. So then you don't give that revenue to Apple because they they charge you a ton of money on the Apple and Google Play exactly. stores because they take like 30%, I think, of every app sale. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's so it's it's hosted under this one company that has like thousands of other trainers. And so when you sign up through me, like you are my subscriber, but you get access to all these other trainers too. So it's amazing. Like it's great. And you could get nutrition, like there's nutritional guidance in there. There's um I have like stretching things, I've got balance things. It's it's great. And I think the problem is that a lot of people we're just like app fatigue. People don't want to be on their phones anymore. Well, our phones are watching us. That's the that creepy is. thing. Yeah. Like have you ever had a dinner conversation with someone and talked about like Edition. Fiji, for example, and then like later on that night you're scrolling and you just see like eight advertisements for Fiji. I've turned that off. You know that's a setting, right? The it's a voice it's thing. a setting, yeah, okay. definitely. But but sometimes you like sometimes then you have to put on your microphone and camera again if you need to do a, yeah. a Zoom call or a WhatsApp call and someone wants to see your face and then you forget to turn it back on and then you're just getting bombarded with yeah. advertisements. I yeah, I it, it did happen to me for a while, but thankfully I've I I don't get that as much. But also that was me. I did online marketing. I was that person. Okay, target people who have been at this location in the past ten days with a ten mile radius. Like you can do that. They've made some changes with iOS privacy, but that was that's how you used to be able to Facebook ad target. Was you know the scariest thing that ever happened to me with my phone. Um, I was in Palm Springs, California. Mm -hmm visiting a family member yeah and i walked past an at&t shop and my phone vibrated and sent me a message saying we're having a special at this at&t shop oh, at this yeah. address like and i was like how does my phone know that i'm next to an at&t shop yeah and then i went through my phone and i deleted everything and i went through all the settings i was like that is that, is, that is used to what year was that it was before covid it was like 20 I think it was like 2018 or 2019 really? where I started to become afraid of my phone. They Yeah, because they made that change because that was a thing. Like you could set an ad to go off like and, and do that to target people who visited a certain address or if they've been on this block like it. You can do that and you can't do it anymore. So I kind of missed that because it, it was a good way to get. It was a good way to get people, but it was kind of creepy. creepy. It's it kind of creepy. creepy, yeah. Yeah. As an advertiser, I miss that ability. Yeah. But as a person, I'm like, get away from me. So yeah. I, I see it and I get it. Because I mean, like, what if you're, you know, what, I mean, then people know where you are. And I kind of, I loved it back in the day. And like, you know, if your dad, if your dad asks you out for dinner and you don't want to go, you can just say, oh, I've got a work meeting. But then if, if, if he, he gets some kind of thing, like, oh, he's at a bar next to an AT&T shop and, yeah. and the, your whole family's like, oh, your son's at an AT&T shop. It's exactly. like, what the fuck is going exactly. on? Exactly. I was feeling like, like hermiting the other day and I was supposed to go hang out with my friends and I was like, I don't really don't want to. And I was like, just say, just say your meeting ran late or something. And she's like, oh wait, they can see your location, right? I'm like, yeah. So yeah. Okay. see, and then you, and then you post on Instagram, you're having fun with other friends and they're like, fuck you. <laughs> Yeah. No, but it was it was all good. So I, I don't know. It's um. So what did you do during COVID? How did you hunker down? How did you get through it all? Because I had a really like obviously I couldn't get on an airplane and I couldn't film at all. So I had a really slow couple of years. It's been pretty brutal. Uh -huh. So I 2019 was like a really good year. So I was like excited for 2020 and like I had my highest revenue month, February 2020. So I was going in strong. Oh my God, that's awesome. Yeah. And then, um, so I think at that point I had started talking with my ex. So I did have a relationship during most of COVID. So I was doing a lot of traveling like up north and then he would come down, then I would go up and book back and forth because um, he was in Cirque du Soleil. So they didn't have jobs anymore. Um, that company went bankrupt. Like that Canadian, that be, Canadian yeah. company went bankrupt. Yeah, I read I that. Him being on those calls, and it was like, I think they're gonna bail us out because Cirque is Canada, so like they need to have us. Um, so they had something figured out to save it. But he was in creation for a new show, so that's easy to get cut because it hasn't even been, you know, out there. That's yet. terrible. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so there was that. So I was kind of you know, doing T-lag back and forth um, up there and down. So everything was virtual. 
Um, I ended up doing a lot of hosting for different Instagram accounts like Women's Health, Strong Fitness Magazine, also Canadian, pretty sure. Um, uh, Viore, the the clothing. I was in the Viore Active Club leading workouts. I did my own. I had some of my friends lead workouts on Train Like a Gymnast. So I did get into more hosting. And then 2021 happened. Um, I was I used to be with Wilhelmina Models. Um, I left them in 2022, but I got a job with iFit, which is like Peloton for Nordic Track Pro Form free motion machines. And so I was leading treadmill classes all of 2021. That's right. They have the Peloton treadmill thing with the big screen. I've seen these. Yeah. yeah. So so for iFit, it's like they're direct competitors. Um, so I did do that. And it was great money. I love the people. And I uh, flew to Utah like every month to do that for one to three weeks at a time. And it was great. And I missed that. But that was when that fitness bubble was like huge. And I was doing like three live classes a day. Pretty sure. Um that's epic. Yeah, it was good. Three live classes a day. Uh huh. Until they were like, "Okay, we're getting rid of lives." Oh, that's terrible. Right, because they weren't making, they were spending too much money on it, or the bubble. Well, yeah, they were spending a ton because they covered like everything for us: our flight, our per diem, per class, our rental cars, like everything for all of these trainers doing treadmill and bike. And then um, by 2022, people started going back you know, to the offices and stuff. Live attendance was dropping because people were going back to the office or they were working. It wasn't th- so it, it just wasn't making sense anymore. And then similar to the problem Peloton still has is, okay, once everyone has a piece of equipment, now you're just making money on memberships. Like that, that pay, that doesn't make sense for your, like a company's revenue to sustain them. Yeah, you need like a subscription service, right? Where people are paying nine ninety nine or whatever to get yeah. the like, to download the new set of workouts or something like that. And if you're like, I just, I don't need that. I can just get on the treadmill myself. Then you lose all those people. So that's kind of what was happening. So if it had to cut lives, I think they might do every now and then like a a race or something. Um, but yeah, I hope I can go back to them this year and do something because I would love to. I love them. But that's kind of what I was able to sustain during COVID, thankfully. And it was very busy for me. I was doing a lot. So grateful for that. I have a good story. You ready? Story time. Um, March. So I ramped up my entire company. I had my own television production company. <laughs> and uh, we made my own shows uh, with that company. And uh, we made another show in China with Tencent, which is one of their big streamers. Mm-hmm. And um, so in... In January 2020, I was in Dubai, and we were setting up uh, a lot of big projects in Saudi Arabia, actually. Oh, wow. Yeah, because... We're in a part of the world, man. Yeah. So um, I was very encouraged by this, actually, because Saudi Arabia was um, going to launch, you know, they wanted to bring in international tourists, and they wanted people to come and, and, and see their country for what it really is, or, or what they wanted to show people, yeah. at least. Right. Um, and, but I thought, like, well, you know what? Like my whole life, I've been boots on the ground, like yeah. not in a military sense, but in a storytelling sense. So I worked mm-hmm. for the New York Times. I lived in China. Right. I covered China. So I was like, if I want to understand Saudi Arabia, no matter what's going on, good, bad, ugly, I need to see it for myself. Um, and I'm going to be the one to tell those stories. So I, I signed up a bunch of big projects in Saudi Arabia in at the end of 2019 and mm-hmm. beginning of 2020. And I hired a few extra people in early 2020. So we were all ramped up, ready to go. And then I was in Ethiopia filming in the Simeon Mountains mm. um, in the second week of March when the whole world kind of just closed. And yeah, I barely got out of Ethiopia. I was going to say, can you imagine being stuck? We Sorry. Yeah. I have a tangent sidetrack. Okay. Remember to bring that. Go ahead. Yeah, you can you can come back to it now. I mean, like I got, so I, I mean, I was literally on a mountainside wow. uh, when the world closed. And then, um, yeah, we had to race back to the capital. We had, to, we had to hike hours to get to the nearest road, get back to the capital. And then while we were going back to the capital, um, like the countries were just closing like dominoes, just bang, bang, bang. Because my, um, my, my director of photography actually lived in Bali. So we were traveling so much. We were traveling so much. We all just kind of like lived wherever we wanted mm-hmm. um, because we were working so hard, two weeks on, two weeks off. So the two weeks off, we all just kind of found cheap, relaxing right. places in the world to live on. So my director of photography lived in Bali. Um, 
and like had a little life there. Like he had a little property and a bike and, mm. and, but then he, um, but then we got, he, Indonesia closed their borders. So he, we were, we were in Ethiopia and all he wanted to do was go back to Bali to surf and hang out. Right. He couldn't even go back there. So he ended up having to go back to Canada. And then I ended up in Istanbul for four months. So it was, um, it was definitely a, a wild ride, but then we did get back to filming in 2020 in the summer. Oh, only to get shut down again in November when the yeah. second lockdowns came. Yeah. And that was that was the one that was the toughest. Right, right, right. Uh, I think there was, the, there was the double one. The double. The double whammy. Yeah. yeah. But what's your tangent? You've been holding on to it. Um, I almost lost it. Yeah. It was, I think it was either a movie or a docuseries about this couple that got, I feel like it was on Netflix or something. It was called like 409 Days or something. And it was this couple that was on a trip. I don't know if it was their or their first date or something. And then COVID happened and they got like locked together for that entire time. And I can't remember where. Sounds like Australia. Australia was surprisingly fascist during the pandemic. I had a, I had a friend of mine in, in, in Melbourne and he was like in his house for a year. Yeah. Yeah. No, this, they were, I feel like it was someplace in South America because they were surrounded by a bunch of like forest wildlife in their car they like got stuck in like a really big pothole the locals had to help them but th this was literally i think it was like they met on a dating app it was like their first date if you guys know what i'm talking about please comment it because i can't life of me think of it leave it in the comments and we'll yeah. check it out please. yeah please yeah. um and they were only meant to go there for like the weekend and then that weekend is when it shut down. So these kind of strangers just ended up living together for this whole time. Was it happily ever after or did she end up like, you know, I think they're just disappearing now. Yeah. But um, they they have that experience together that was just like once in a lifetime that will never happen. So that bonded them together. Most most marriages don't last 400 days. I mean, good, good, good work for them. I know COVID either made you realize what you did not want or like, yeah, this is going to work. So I have so many friends here in LA that had COVID babies oh, yeah. because they were just home all the time. And yeah. I guess it was just easy. What else? Accessible. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. And then these kids like Jason's daughter, she's nine. And you know, during those formative years doing virtual schooling or having masks on and not really getting that face to face it's generation alpha it's going to be really interesting because gen z like they had already grown up with normalcy and then okay they lost their graduations and and things but when you're a kid and you're learning body language and facial expressions and emotions and you're isolated or you know you can't see your friend's face that's going to have a very interesting impact and i'm curious how they're gonna well they're all just going to be traumatized adults right Apparently, I mean, we all are, so hey. We're, <laughs> we're all just trying to get through. No idea what we're doing. We all have our own stories, but yeah, so it's very, very interesting. So what are you looking forward to most in 2024? Where is your year headed? Didn't mean to put you on the spot. Yeah, but, no, yeah. I, I've plotted stuff out for Train Like a Gymnast. Like, okay, this is what I want to talk about each week, each month, do these kinds of events. Like, yeah, I'm looking forward to getting back hopefully in person and training people again um, for training like a gymnast events and maybe I can travel for them, this and that. But I'm also wanting to lean more into hosting. And so I have a hosting agent now. I have voiceover agent. I've just kind of shifted some things around. Um, and I want to, and I want to start doing that more because I'm not an actress. I mean, I just, not an actress. I'm very, very good it's at. It's tough to remember your lines. I struggle. I don't. I don't have a photographic memory. Yeah, I. It's, it's that. It's yeah. like I don't know where all that would be stored. But doing live treadmill classes where I don't even know what I've talked about, but I've been, I've been talking for thirty minutes. I can do that fine. I can interview fine, and like the live, I'm good. Just send me. But if I have to be precise, it's it's so much harder. And some people are totally opposite of that. Um, so yeah, I just want to lean more into that. I've got, you know, uh, one of my clients, Melissa Peterman, she was on Reba and she's on Young Sheldon and she does a lot of hosting herself. So she kind of helps me out with that, um, with advice and things. But yeah. And she's a fitness trainer and an actress. No, 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 no. Oh. She's my client. Oh, she's your client. But she could be. Yeah. She should be someday. Um, should we get her, should we get her onto your, to be hosting on your app? Would that be helpful? <laughs> 
Well, we already make silly like Instagram reels and TikToks together because she's just like, oh, let's do this. Let's do this. She has all the ideas. And then um, I was on American Ninja Warrior uh, a couple of years. And so Akbar Gabajabian Mila is a mentor of mine and he gives me advice as well. And I recently met Terry Crews at, um, at an influencer event and I want to tap into all these people's, um, just tap into their brains and learn more and just get their advice and stuff. Terry Crews is a legend. He's, he's so ripped, isn't he? He's ripped, yeah, but he's also really, really good vibe, good energy that I got from him. And what he told me was just don't be afraid to be yourself. Like, don't try to be a host or a presenter. Just be you. And if you cry for something, like, you cry for something. And that's, I love that because I'm all about authentic- authenticity and just find yourself and be yourself. I've always been someone who's, like I am me, this is it. Like I will better myself, but I'm still just me. I'm not. It's that's actually really important because I chatted with a few people before I started doing this, mm-hmm. and I was like, okay, like you know, should I try to have like a self help podcast or a you know manage your time better podcast or a get fit podcast or something like that? Yeah. And and then one of my friends was just like, no, you're an interesting guy. Just just have your own podcast and just talk to people. And people will like it or people hate it. And more people will probably like it than hate it. And the people who hate it will probably leave some nasty messages or they'll just be too busy, but they'll hate it quietly. Yeah. And then you just get on with it and and you just, you know, you have interesting friends and people come on and you just have like a a random chat. Like everyone's like, what's the focus of your podcast? I'm just like, you're the focus of it. But like, just come on on and let's talk. Like, why does it have to be about something? Yeah, it's very interesting because of the ones that I've been on, they always have some kind of category or a thing well that's the fastest way to monetize right. so i think i think when you when i think in any business or as any entrepreneur if if you if you what? if you try to do the one thing as fast as possible to monetize you miss everything mm. maybe that's how i feel and i and i it's very relatable understandable because i i don't everyone tells me like focus like do your one thing but i just like it drives me nuts because if someone's just like, oh, yeah, you're you're the gymnast. Yeah, but I'm also a photographer. I'm also a fitness model. I also, you know, do training. I also do this. I also play the flute. I also speak French. Like, I, I hate being one thing. And it, it, okay, sure, I'm a jack of all trades. Like, but I think that's a little more interesting because that's what's cool about me is that I can talk to so many different people about so many different things. And a lot of my friends will say like, oh, you have such interesting, diverse friends because some will be from college, some will be from, you know, parkour, or some will be from just random, random stuff. But I can talk to them about something. Whereas if you only do this one thing and someone does this thing, how are you going to connect with them? I mean, you can connect on a human level, but... No one wants to connect on a human. It's it's a lot of, yeah, a lot of people don't want to do that because it's like, okay, so tell me like your deepest, darkest... You know, no one wants to have real conversations. Yeah. They don't like to go deep. They don't. So it's um. So the more you let's you know, keep it shallow. Let's talk about work. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's kind of like hot lately, and oh, it's this. Yeah. Oh, it rained so much the yeah. last couple of days. I literally, I literally had somebody. Um, I, I guess you could say I was dating him or whatever. But like in 2014, 15, he because I don't drink. He said, "Well, you don't drink, so I don't like. I don't really know what what we could do." And I was like, because drinking is everything. What? There are so many other things we could do besides go get drinks somewhere. Like, I just, that's something with society. Like, alcohol is the only thing that people, like, the only drug that people ask you why you don't do it. It's just create, there are other ways to celebrate a promotion. Like, there are other ways to, you know, I I, I don't know. It just dominates the life, right? Like, I think uh, if for people who, for people who aren't that, um, who don't have that much of an imagination, I suppose, about things that can but be they done. you have it. They need to tap into it. They need to tap into that imagination. It was there where all these little kids just trying to be adults in this big world. Well, that's a nice way to, to, to maybe wrap, wrap it up. Yeah, yeah, the authenticity. That's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Well, look, uh, thank you so much for swinging by. Yeah. And uh, come by any time. It's always interesting. Yeah. And I'll I'll see. We're going to do this. And now he can see us both on the same camera. Oh, yeah, we do. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Great. Good conversation. <laughs> Fade the black and we're out.